Well, good morning and welcome. It's good to be here and good to have you here. And I want to particularly welcome some of you who may notice a, an unfamiliar face at the front. So I want to welcome Brenda who joined us this morning and helping lead us in music. And uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to chat with her back after the service. And I'm delighted to have the more the merrier, is my feeling. And I'm delighted to, uh, to have her here. Our service this morning is morning prayer from the Book of Alternative Services. You should have a green book available to you for parts of it, and you should have the blue hymn book available. So I'll give you a minute to look around, make sure there's one around you. I think uh, Wilbur was running around making sure everybody had hymn books a bit earlier, so I think we're good. And uh, then we'll begin. I am the way, the truth, and the life, says the Lord. No one comes to the Father but by me. And our opening hymn is number 395 in the blue hymn books. Come, let us join our cheerful song, number 395. springs of 
salvation. Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, 
and to the spring of blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned him on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At the time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicates the removing of what can be shaken, that is, create things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful, and so worship God acceptably, with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gradual hymn is number 186 in the blue hymn books. Jesus calls us for the temple. We stand together to sing and remain standing for the gospel reading that follows.
speak to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. One of the things which probably wouldn't have been a surprise if you saw the pile of books in my basement is that I like to read books on odd subjects. And I sometimes I get on a little train, a little chain of books and follow through. So when I went to uh, Washington in the, in the spring, I picked up a bunch of books on sort of the American Revolution and things around it that I've been kind of digging around. Now, there's a reason I'm saying this. That's partly because, as you know, if you look at the news, lots of people are making all sorts of statements about what the Founding Fathers wanted and didn't want, and who knows, so I'm trying to find out. <laughs> I don't think it's helping. But, but you find interesting little tidbits, and, and I kind of enjoy those interesting little tidbits. And one of the ones that I ran into just in the last week was at Harvard University, prior to the very early part of the American Revolution, used to list their students by order of their parents' social standing. In, in that British sense of, you know, if you were royalty or a Viscount or a whatever it is, Earl, or you had a third cousin twice removed from the Lord or something. Well, they, in those days, people knew that stuff really well. So they used to list them in order of how important they were. Now, this was a very small university at that time. They only had perhaps 100 students or so. But they thought that this was an important thing to know about them. In fact, they thought really that was the most important thing to know about this person, was where they fit into this great Elizabethan chain of being. Well, one of the things that changed when the revolution sort of started to, to build was they decided instead to list the students in alphabetical order. Now, at one level, like, who cares what order they put the files in, in the filing cabinet or whatever they had. But it reflected a real and deep difference in what they people at the time thought mattered about somebody. It really mattered, prior to the revolution, where you fit into the great scheme of things in terms of your social importance or the political importance of your families. Now, I'm sure people have ways nowadays of finding out where people come from. And there are people always figure out how to sort each other out in ways that are not always what we would like them to. But what we call people and what we, how we divide people up matters a lot. And it matters not just because we know, but because it influences who they are. So this is a story. I have no idea if this story really happened. It's too good to be true. It probably didn't. But it's a good story and it illustrates the point. So take that for what it's worth. The story is told of a man who went through the forest and he was seeking any kind of bird of interest that he might find. And he caught a very young eagle and he brought it home and he put it with the ducks and the chickens and the turkeys and he gave it chicken food to eat, even though it was an eagle, the king of birds. And so this, this eagle got raised with the chickens. Well, five years later, a naturalist happened to be in the area. And after he passed through the garden, he called the guy over and he said, You know that, that that bird is an eagle, right? It's not a chicken. Yes, said the owner, but I've trained it to be a chicken. It's no longer an eagle. It is a chicken, even though it measures 15 feet from wingtip to wingtip. No, nope, said the naturalist, it is an eagle still. It has the heart of an eagle, and it will soar to the highest heavens. No, nope, said the owner, it's a chicken. It's never going to fly. Well, they agreed to test it. So the naturalist picked up the eagle, held it up, and said with great intensity, Eagle, thou art an eagle. Thou dost belong to the sky and not to this earth. Stretch forth thy wings and fly. And the eagle looked this way and that way, and saw the chickens eating their food and jumped down and started scratching away with the chickens. The owner said, I told you it was a chicken. No, it's an eagle. Give me another chance tomorrow. So the next day he took it to the top of the house and he see it and said, Eagle, thou art an eagle, stretch forth thy wings and fly. And again the eagle looked down at the chickens, jumped down and started scratching and feeding with the chickens. No, the owner said, I told you it was a chicken. No, said the naturalist, it is an eagle, it has the heart of an eagle, give me one more chance, 
and I'll make it fly tomorrow. Well, the next morning he rose early and he took the eagle outside the city and away from the houses to the foot of a high mountain. And the sun was just rising, gilding the top of the mountain with gold, and every crag was glistening in the, the joy of the beautiful morning. And he picked up the eagle and said, Eagle, thou art an eagle, thou dost belong to the sky and not to the earth. Stretch forth thy wings and fly. And the eagle looked around and trembled a little bit, but it stayed there. The naturalist then made it look at the sun, and suddenly it stretched out its wings and streaked, and off it went and never returned. And it turned out, even though it had been kept and tamed as a chicken, it really was an eagle. I don't think that really happened, but it's a good story. <laughs> What we call people and what we tell people about who they are matters. What we tell people about their worth and what we tell people about the source of their worth matters. And the things that we look at when we decide what value we impart to somebody matter. Society has a way of dehumanizing us and that sadly can cause us to, to not realize our worth before God. We confuse our price with our worth. And as, as a result, sometimes people only think they're worth what someone is willing to pay them. And in some cases, that's not very much. There is much more to what we are worth than what the market tells us. It's easy to forget we are eagles when all we hear is that we're chickens. Today's gospel passage is about Jesus healing a woman who's been crippled for 18 years. She's bent over, she's unable to look up, she's unable to do all the things that other people are easily able to do. And the society at that time would have regarded her, well for many reasons, as not worth much. But Jesus calls her over and heals her. There's a lot of things happening in that little gospel passage, and I probably missed a couple, but here are just some of the things that are going on. The first is Jesus speaks to this woman. So what? Well, in those days, that wasn't something that you did. Jewish men did not speak to women. Remember the story in the gospel according to John where Jesus speaks to the Samaritan woman at a well. And remember that she's surprised that, that a Jewish man would speak to a Samaritan. And when the disciples returned, the, the, the gospel says they were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. So right away, the fact that he calls her over and speaks to her, that's important. He calls her over to him to the center of the synagogue. And so he, right away in doing that, he's challenging that idea that well, men really know what they're doing, and the women should perhaps ask the men when they get home. <clears throat> Thirdly, he touches her, something that would have been forgiven, forbidden under the holiness code, because, of course, when he touched her, he would take on whatever uncleanness, whatever sinfulness had, been, had brought her to this state. Fourth thing is he calls her a daughter of Abraham. That's not a term that is used before then. It's pretty revolutionary to think that because it was believed that women would be saved more or less through their man. But he makes her a full-fledged memory, a member rather, of the people of Israel with equal standing before God. That's a pretty revolutionary thing that he did. Her value comes from who she is, not who her husband or whoever else is in her life is. Two more. He heals on the Sabbath day. And in doing this, he demonstrates that God's compassion for people is more important than all those rules. And he reclaims the Sabbath not as a, a time to sit there quietly and not do anything, but a celebration of God's goodness. And finally, he challenges the belief that somehow her illness is a direct punishment from God for something that she's done wrong. She's not ill because God willed it, but because there is evil in the world. 
bad things do happen to good people. And just because a bad thing has happened to her does not mean that she is a bad person. So running through all of those things is Jesus is saying to her that your worth to God, your worth in the eyes of God is not limited by the fact that you have this disability. Your value as a child of God, as a daughter of Abraham is much more important than any of that. Now, as you might imagine, the leaders of the synagogue were not that happy about it because it challenged a lot of the things that they taught, a lot of the things that they believed. And one of them goes around telling anybody who will listen, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days to be cured and not on the Sabbath day. Don't ruin my Sabbath with his healing nonsense. Another story. This one probably didn't happen, but I like it. There's an usher in a church, and a man under the influence staggers into the service, and he sits at the front row. And as the preacher starts its sermon, the man starts shouting out, Amen! Praise the Lord! Hallelujah! After every sentence, practically. And the entire congregation, they're probably Anglican, they're coming a little embarrassed, <laughs> a little agitated over this behavior. So an usher makes his way to the front to escort the gentleman out. And when the usher informs the man that he was making too much noise, he says, Well, brother, I just got the Holy Spirit. To which the usher said, Well, you didn't get it here, so you have to leave. <laughs> Pretty sure we wouldn't do that, but I'm not actually sure what we would do in that situation. So. <laughs> By the power of God, Jesus healed this woman who was bent over and had been for 18 years. And the synagogues leader's response is, you didn't get that power of God here, not on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered him and says, you hypocrites, do not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger, manger and lead it away to give it water. And not, not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day. Come on, he says, don't be ridiculous. God is at work here. Don't throw those rules in the way of God's love and care for this valuable daughter of Abraham. You might see a crippled up old woman who's making your service a little more complicated. God sees one of his children who is suffering. To Jesus, God isn't about setting up the rules. God is about bringing love and healing to God's people. I'm pretty sure all of us, or most of us at least, know that life sometimes has a way of, of beating us down, of, of sapping us of our enthusiasm, our plans that don't go the way we hope they will. And we can find ourselves perhaps not physically bent over, but, but emotionally or spiritually bent over from the things in our lives that haven't gone the way we hope they would. And we can end up like that woman, lurking at the edges, wondering if we're worthy to enter, wondering if really are we, does anybody care, or are we worth anything here? And Jesus calls us to be healed of that, and to accept, to believe, to know that we are of value to God, whatever our situation is. Come before God that knowing that, that God doesn't see the things that you've done wrong. Oh God, no, let me rephrase that. God does know those things. But God loves you anyway. And God wants you healed and forgiven and to have that new life. We are sons and daughters of Abraham. That's what matters to God, not what kind of job we had or what we do in the church or what we do the rest of the time or what we've done wrong in our lives, all those things that come to our mind when we say, well, am I, do I matter to anybody? Am I worth anything? And Jesus' answer is, absolutely. You are worth the life of my son. You are worth as much as anyone. Now that beats all heck from the being a chicken. Next week I might have to preach something good about chickens. <laughs> Amen.
In your bulletin, you'll find the word for the Apostles' Creed. We stand together and affirm the faith we share. We say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our offertory hymn, number 529, Just As I Am.
Wilson, we pray together. God of glory, receive all we offer this day as a symbol of our love, and increase in us that true and perfect gift. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We move to our time of prayer. You may sit, stand, or kneel as you find most helpful. <clears throat> In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. Today, let us give thanks and pray for the continued success and safety of those fighting wildfires in the center part of our island. And let us pray for our children and the youth as they prepare for another school year. We pray that schools will be safe and welcoming and offer them an education of their whole person. We pray also for our church, our parish. St. Mary's, that will have wisdom and courage to be able to reach out into our community and share the good news of our Lord and Savior. We pray for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for all those who are our own. We pray for our community and our country. We pray for our leaders. We pray for Justin, our, our Prime Minister, for Andrew, our Premier, for John, our mayor, and all who take offices for civil civic leadership. We pray for our country and the world, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. We pray for the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. We pray for you today. We remember Crystal, Florence, David, Jennifer, Dale, Alex, Naomi, Lily, Rhonda, Pamela. We pray also for those people who are experiencing adversities across the world. We pray for those who are being adversely affected by extremes of heat, extremes of rainfall, extremes of drought, all these things caused by climate change throughout our world. Let's pray for God's grace to help us to seek wise solutions to those environmental problems. Let's give thanks for doctors and nurses and for all who provide care to the sick and the infirm. We pray for the health and well-being of, their, of all of these people as they offer their ministry to us. And let us pray for, let us pray for a creative solution to the dilemma that we find in our country of having insufficient numbers of caretakers and <coughs> medical professionals. Let us ask God to find us a creative, a creative way to deal with that. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. Let us pray for the church throughout the world. At home here we pray in our tri-diocesan cycle of prayer. We pray for the retired clergy of our three dioceses. We also pray for those who have served or are serving in non-parochial positions. And for those who are on leave from their respective dioceses. We pray for Parish of Rose Blanche, we 
pray for the people at St. Michael, Rose Blanche, St. George, Bird Island, St. Thomas the Foil, and we pray for the priest in charge of Reverend Diana Fry. In the Anthem Cycle of Prayer, we pray for the Diocese of Southeastern Mexico. For the peace and unity of the Church of God, for all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. We pray for John, our bishop. We pray for Keith, our priest, and we pray for we pray for Sheila, our deacon, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in His church. Let's just take a minute of silence in our own hearts to raise before the Lord those issues that we have in our own lives. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for those who have died in the peace of Christ, and for those whose faith is known to you alone, that they may have a place in your eternal. Let your loving kindness be upon them. Who will put their trust in you. Gracious God, you have heard the prayers of your faithful people, and you know our needs before we ask, and our ignorance in asking. Grant our requests as may be best for us. This we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Scripture exalts us to, in everything, give thanks. So I would invite you to pray with me to. Thanksgiving on the first Thanksgiving on page 129. The general Thanksgiving at the top of the page. In unison, let us pray. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks. For all your goodness and loving kindness to us and for all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, in your immeasurable love, in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with true we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and may walk before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom you and the Holy Spirit be our honor and glory for all ages. Amen.
The Diocesan Women's Weekend is coming up in September, March 16th to 18th. Uh, some of you have been to these over the years. They seem to be a lot of fun. They don't tell me what they do there, but it's not that secret. But I think there's teaching, there's fellowship, there's a chance to get away. And I know the people who've gone have enjoyed it very much. So if you're thinking about going, I can get you some more details. I don't have details on a lot of this yet, but if you think you would like the information, we can certainly get you some. Licensed Lay Ministers Conference is on October, middle of October, and the Men's Weekend is October 28th to 30th. So those are three weekends coming up all at Max Sims Camp. As near as I can tell, Max Sims has not been impacted by the fires. It's not far from them, but I'm really, really hoping and praying that they're long out by the time we get to the middle of September. So that, those are opportunities, and again, if you'd like some information on those, let me know, and I'll make sure you get the information. The Bishop will be offering an online course on the Eucharist on a number of Thursday evenings, starting on September 15th. So anyone is welcome to participate in this. It's a bit of a command performance, I think, for Eucharistic assistants and licensed lay ministers. Um, but it should be interesting, and again, I don't have a lot of details at this point, but let me know if you're interested, and I will give you that information. Um, I think that's most of what we need to announce at this point. Sheila, I think, is back next week. She'll be back rested and, and uh, all tanned and fit and all that, I presume. We'll find out. And once again, thank you to Brenda for joining us this morning, and hopefully we might see you again. We'll chat afterwards. But thank you very much for this. So we stand for the blessing and for our final day. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. And our final hymn, number 401, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Yes.